Thank you, Don. Good morning, everyone. Give me, give me just a second to get set up. I promise you if my MS makes me fall down, I'll get up and keep going. So <clears throat> I'm blessed to have this opportunity to uh, share this time with you this morning. Before I get too far along in my talk, would you open your packages and everyone should have, I believe, both a purple and yellow paper, although I only found a purple one in mine. So uh, I think everyone at least has a purple paper and it's important that you have it out and uh, be ready to, to make some notes on it when I instruct you to do that. The title of my talk is Blessed, Broken, and Scared. And I think that you might find that a strange title, Blessed, Broken, and Scared. But as I complete the talk, hopefully that title will make more sense to you. You know, I've, told that, I've been told that it's important that we be bold and that we are willing to be a fool for Christ. Well, I assure you that I'm not a singer, but it's been put on my heart to sing a little bit of a song for you, so I will most likely sing off key but I'm willing to be a fool for Christ, and if you'll help me a little bit with this, it might even be easier. So just a little bit of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My friends, I truly was lost, and I'll be sharing that story with you. And as you just heard, in 2014, I was totally blind for a period of 15 days. I've recovered some of that sight, uh, but not all of it. I would tell you that during those 15 days when I was hospitalized, um, I prayed to God never to give me my sight back because in that period of time in total blindness, I've never seen God more clearly than I did when nothing else was obstructing my vision. I um, would also uh, want to share with you my hope for, for my message this morning, and that is that my message inspires you to be more honest with yourself, more honest with others, and that you will all be able to be better evangelizers for Christ. You'll find that I'm a storyteller, and I have many stories to share with you this morning. But before I share my first story, I would like to ask for a moment of honesty. By a show of hands, could I ask how many of you are willing to admit that every time you find yourself going to the confessional to confess your sins, or if you're just at that moment of despair and you look up and you ask God for forgiveness, how many of you find that you're confessing the same sin over and over and over again? Look around, guys. You're not alone in this. Look around. Okay. So we find that we're often confessing the same sin over and over. I'd like to share a story with you. Many of you may be familiar with this story. It comes out of the book, The Great Divorce, written by C.S. Lewis. And in that story, there's a man right at the gates of heaven, and he's just ready to go into heaven. And the man has a lizard on his shoulder. And C.S. Lewis uses that lizard to represent the recurring sin in that man's life. And so he's right there to go in, and an angel confronts him and he says, sir, are you willing to get rid of the lizard? And the man says, well, of course. And the angel steps forward and says, then can I kill it? And the man says, hold on, you, you didn't say anything about killing it. And the angel says, well, if you want to get into heaven, I have to kill it. Well, you know, I've grown quite accustomed to this lizard over time. And he'll just sit here quietly. He won't bother anyone. And the angel said again, but can I kill it? And the man reluctantly agreed. And the angel stepped forward and wrenched the neck of the lizard. And suddenly that lizard 
turned into a brilliant white stallion that the man rode into heaven. So perhaps that recurring sin in our life that was depicted by C.S. Lewis's lizard can be the stallion that helps us get in if we just allow our God to imbue his mercy on us and that we willingly kill that lizard, that recurring sin in our life. Let me share another story. Mom had just finished baking some fresh chocolate chip cookies. The smell of the chocolate chip cookies was wafting through the whole house when little Johnny comes bounding into the room. And mom says, Johnny, do not take one of these chocolate chip cookies. Immediately after she said that, mom went to the other end of the house. She had things to do, and she left Johnny alone with the cookie jar. What did Johnny do? He took a cookie. And later on, mom came into the kitchen, and she says, Johnny, did you take a cookie from this cookie jar? And what was Johnny's response? No, mommy, I didn't take a cookie from the cookie jar. And she pressed it a little further, and she said, Johnny, now don't lie to me. Did you take a cookie from the cookie jar? And he says, my sister Sally said I could have one. Johnny, did you take a cookie from the cookie jar? And with quivering lip, he looks up to his mother and says, yes, mom, but I'll never do it again. Does anyone believe Johnny's not taken another cookie from the cookie jar? Of course he is. And I call that the Adam and Eve syndrome. Because what we do is we commit sin, and then God puts it on our heart that we sin, and what do we do? We go, I didn't do it. And when God weighs a little heavier on us, we go, but it was someone else's fault. And when he presses us a little further, we look up and we said, God, I'm sorry, and I'll never do it again. And what do we do? We do it again. We do it again. Now, you all have your purple paper. This is the toughest exercise of the day, so if you'll take out your paper. I have two sets of questions. One, I'm going to ask you to write your answers on one side of the paper. And then when I tell you to flip it over, I'd like you to write your answer on the other side of the paper. And because you're sitting in such close proximity to each other, this is your opportunity to invent encrypted hieroglyphics because you don't want anyone else to know what you're writing on that paper. So you can make a symbol, you can make a dot, an asterisk, you can put anything you want that means something to you and nothing to any other prying eyes that's looking over your shoulder, okay? Has everybody got it? Now here's the good news. As soon as you're done writing it, you're gonna fold it up, you're gonna put it in your pocket, and no one's ever going to see it, and when you get home, you're going to put it in the shredder or something, okay? So on the first side of the piece of paper, I've got a series of questions, and as you hear the series, any one of these that means something to you, make some symbol to indicate that. So the first set of questions is, do you have anyone in your life that you're having a struggle to forgive? Is forgiveness a problem for you? And if it is, make some indication of that. How about grief? Are you dealing with the recent loss of a family member or a loved one, a friend? If you're struggling with grief in your life, make a note of that. How about loneliness? Are you dealing with some profound loneliness? Maybe health issues. Are you or your wife or your children or a friend dealing with health issues? Marital strife? family strife, or financial difficulty. So that's the whole litany of questions. If any one of those means something to you, make a note of that. And once you've completed making your notes, flip your paper over, and on the other side of the paper, 
I'm going to ask you the most difficult question of the day, and I would like you to write on your purple paper what that recurring sin is in your life. I don't want you to write down some horrible sin from years ago that may have been there that you've long since sought forgiveness for. I'm asking you to write down that sin that you find yourself going into the confessional and saying, I did it again. I did it again. Take a moment. I need a moment of honesty. Write that down. I'd like everybody to do it. Everybody has one. Fold it up and put it in your pocket. We're going to be talking about that all day, all morning this morning. Now the first part of the talk, the title of the talk was Blessed, Broken, and Scared. So we're going to talk about blessed. And if I were to ask you all the question, what is the greatest blessing in your life? With all the number of people here, we may have that many different answers. And many of you may say, maybe it's my spouse. My spouse is my greatest blessing. Some of you may say it's your children. Some of you may say it's life itself. Maybe it was your parents that was the greatest blessing. Perhaps it's your health. Maybe it's the fact that you live in America or you have food or shelter or clothing. But I'm going to submit to you that the greatest blessing, and we think back to our first talk, that the greatest blessing in life is mercy, forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life. Mercy, forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life because without those, the other ones don't matter. But it's the promise of God's mercy and forgiveness that lets us know that there is something much bigger than this life. And guys, mercy, forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life are gratuitous, unwarranted, and undeserved. You know, today's readings that we're going to hear at Mass this morning, our responsorial hymn, The Lord is Kind and Merciful, how cool is that that it happened to be today during this conference? And what story are we going to get in the gospel today? The prodigal son. And what do we hear in the story of the prodigal son? While the son was still far off, the father caught sight of him and ran to him. And what did he do? He didn't use it for an opportunity to give him a lecture and all the bad things he did. He threw a party. If you don't know the song, When God Ran, look it up, Google it, get it on your iPad, and listen to the song, When God Ran, on a regular basis. Now let's look at what the Bible tells us about this greatest gift of mercy. Romans says, but God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Luke says this, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save what was lost. Matthew says, what is your opinion? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, will he not leave the ninety-nine in the hills and go in search of the stray? And if he finds it, amen, I say to you, he rejoices more over the one than the ninety-nine that did not stray. And perhaps the most quoted verse from the Bible from John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. What does Pope Francis say about this? He says this. This is powerful. This is really powerful, guys. Listen to each word here. Only he who has been touched and caressed by the tenderness of God's mercy, really knows the Lord. Only he who has been touched and caressed by the tenderness of God's mercy really knows the Lord. Can I get a giant amen to the fact that we are enormously blessed? Amen? amen. Okay, well that was the fun part because that was the blessed part, but the next part is blessed broken and scared. So let me share another story with you. This was in the fall of 2011. 
I'm involved in Curcio, and as part of Curcio, you make a commitment to be in small groups every week for the rest of your life, and then once a month to go to a bigger gathering. And we were struggling in our parish to get people to fulfill their commitment to come to those gatherings. So I went to my pastor, Father Nick, and I said, why do some people make a commitment to God to do something for the rest of their life and then not do it? I really thought it was a pretty simple question. Little did I know it would be a life-changing answer. And he said to me, Brian, let me pray over it before I answer it. And it was about 10 days later when he called me up and said, Brian, can you come by my office? So I went by his office and he says, Brian, you remember your question you asked me? A few days ago and I said yes and he says Brian what you need to understand is that every single human being is chained to some area of sinfulness in their life every single human being some of us are lucky enough to know what that sin is others of us don't even recognize the sin in our own life but then he said these powerful words. On his desk was a book. The book was titled Unbound by the author Neil Lozano, and he picks up the book, and he said, Brian, and you too are chained to an area of sin in your life, and until you confront your own sin, you'll never be as effective as an evangelizer as you can be and with that he reached across the desk and he handed me this book unbound and gentlemen I sat back in my chair I crossed my arms like he had just read my soul and it was a very dramatic event now let me define for you what I mean when I use the word broken what I mean is anything in our life that clouds our relationship with God. Now, I break brokenness into two forms, broken by sin and wounded by the world. Under broken by sin, Roman tells us this, all have sinned and are deprived of the glory of God. And it goes on to say, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal. Listen to these words sold into slavery of sin. Pope Francis says the church is a field hospital for the hurting and wounded. Now, wounded by the world is often, in many cases, someone else's sin that's impacting my life, or it's just the fact that we live in a broken world, and that broken world is impacting my life. Guys, I want to submit to you that the two most philosophical, theological words ever conjoined together were put on a bumper sticker. And those two words are, stuff happens. It doesn't really say stuff, but I think you know what it says. But it says something like, stuff happens. Okay, so why does a little four-year-old fall into a pool and drown? Because stuff happens. Why does a newly married bride just one week after her wedding get killed in a head-on car accident? Because stuff happens. Why does a tornado go through an area and some people are killed and some aren't? Because stuff happens. And when it does, it can cloud our relationship with God. If you think about what you wrote on your purple paper, what I'm really suggesting to you is that the first set of questions I ask you, if you wrote on that first side, those were wounded by the world questions. And if you flipped over the paper, it was broken by sin. Guys, this is the most difficult thing I want you to think about for just a moment. Every one of you have a piece of purple paper in your pocket. Something's written on it. Does anyone on the planet other than you know what's written on that purple paper? Does anyone on the planet know what's written on your purple paper 
other than you? If not, why not? Are you afraid? Are you scared? Because scared is the next part of this talk, blessed, broken, and scared. If you were to write the word scared, you have the ability to take a note. If you wrote the word scared, circle the C in scared. And I would suggest to you that the C stands for chagrin, for humiliation, embarrassment, and sorrow. That's the definition of chagrin, humiliation, embarrassment, and sorrow. Guys, if we want to live honestly, we have to have a transparent personality. Think about this. Do you all agree? Isn't the Bible clear with the message that Jesus came to save the lost and the broken? Do we all agree with that? So imagine in life there's these two long lines. This line over here is the lost and broken line. And this line over here is everyone that's not lost and broken. If Jesus came to save the lost and broken, which line do you want to be in? Why are we all acting like we're in that line? When you think about it, why are we all acting like we're in the line that he's not coming for? He's coming for the lost and broken line. We should be in this line like a little kid in school saying, Lord, I'm lost and broken. Come save me. But no, that's not what we do. Satan causes us to live in a, a world of delusion and unreality. He varnishes the truth. He uses dishonesty. Guys, let me ask you a question. If I were to finish the rest of my talk wearing this mask, could any of you pay attention to what I'm talking about? Now, put down your pens and papers for a minute and look around this room. Look at the other people. Take the time, I want you to do it. Everyone else in this room, guys, is wearing a mask. Can you take them seriously? Now think about this. Gentlemen, every one of you is wearing a mask. Can anyone take you seriously? There's three types of masks that we wear. The first mask is when we put a mask on to hide ourselves from others. There's a music group called Casting Crowns. They got a great song called Stained Glass Masquerade. And in that song are the lyrics, am I the only one in church today feeling so small? Sometimes we all want to act like we have it so well together that the wounded and the hurting and the lost don't feel like they belong in church. We get walled in by our shame and our pride, and as a result, we don't want anybody else to see the real us because we're not willing to be vulnerable. Mask two is more dangerous than mask one because mask two is when we hide our real self from us. We have put so much makeup on to hide our real selves. We've used self-deception so much that we can't see our own brokenness. There was a man, and he goes into the doctor, and he says, Doctor, I've got this incredible headache. It's just killing me. It hurts all around my head. And the doctor says, let me be clear, sir. It's right around here that it hurts. And he says, yes, doc, that's it. And the doctor says, it's simple, my dear friend. You have your halo on too tight. <laughs> Guys, I submit to you, we may all have our halos on too tight. We have to admit that we're broken so that the mercy of God can come down on us. Now, guys, I don't know, was there yellow paper in your packages or no? Okay, then just pretend there was. The third mask is one that's hard sometimes to get your arms around. And since you don't have the yellow paper, just when you go home, take a piece of paper and set it down in your prayer area where you can pray over that piece of paper. 
Because here's what I'm submitting to you that the third mask is. Is that Satan, because he's the great deceiver, keeps you so focused on your purple paper that you're missing something else that's far deeper that's messing up your relationship with God. Let me give you an example. If lust in unchaste behavior is possibly the sin you're committing over, you're confessing over and over, maybe it's pride that's not giving you the courage to admit your, that sin to anybody, that because you can't admit it, you keep doing it. So really what would be on your yellow paper is pride. Or maybe it's anger that you confess. Every time you go into the confessional, anger, anger, anger. I was angry with my wife. I was angry with my children. But maybe the real sin is that you're a control freak and that you're so focused on controlling everything that when you can't control it, you express that with anger. Does that make sense? Satan has you focusing on what may be a much smaller sin, and you're not confessing and getting to the root of what is a much bigger sin. Does that make sense? Now, guys, we have to have God. We have to admit we're broken, and we got to have God in our life. Now, there's this sales executive on the biggest sales call of his life, and he's running late. And he zooms into downtown Charlotte, looking for a parking space to be on time for his sales call, and he can't find a place to park. He's gonna be late for the sales call, and he looks up to God and he says, God, please, if you'll just find me a parking spot. I promise you, Lord, if you find me a parking spot, I will never miss Mass ever again. Further, God, if you find me a parking spot, I'll give up drinking alcohol for the rest of my life. And just then, like that, miraculously, a parking spot appears. And the man looks up and says, Never mind, God, I found one myself. <laughs> Guys, we can delude ourselves to think we don't need God, but we do. We need to admit that we need to be saved. Romans says, miserable one that I am, who will deliver me from this mortal body? Paul says, of all sinners, I am the worst. Paul affirms that our struggles are real and that sometimes our struggles can be debilitating. But remember what Father Nick told me when he gave me that book. If you're going to be an effective evangelizer, you have to realize that you got a ball and chain of sin around your ankle and you got to pray to God to help you break that ankle. How are you going to know what should be on that yellow paper? How do you know what it is, that brokenness that clouds your relationship? Guys, you have to find time for prayer. If you can go on a retreat, today's a good example, but if you can get away, you're going to hear me talk a lot about going on a silent retreat and how it changed my life. Get away. Spend time with God. Find a place in your home and set aside time for quiet. Find a spiritual director that you can go to and talk to. Use fasting as an opportunity to ask God to reveal your brokenness. Now, I mentioned to you that Father Nick gave me that book, Unbound, in the fall of 2011. In November of 2011, I had the chance to go on an eight-day silent retreat in Clearwater, Florida, at a place called the House of Prayer. Now, my bedroom was here, and right next to it was the, the um, chapel, and we had the tabernacle there, and the presence of the Eucharist was there. And basically that week evolved to like 172 hours of Eucharistic adoration. I was just on my knees. And in the first two or three days, two days there, I finished reading that book, Unbound. And on the third night, in the middle of the night, about three in the morning, all alone in prayer, me and the tabernacle and the Eucharist, I heard God speak to my heart so clearly, it's like you hearing me speak now. Now, I didn't hear him speak audibly, but my heart heard the message. And what I heard is, Brian, if you don't reveal your brokenness, 
you're never going to heal. If you don't reveal your brokenness, you're never going to heal. Now, you all folded up a piece of purple paper with something on it, and I said you don't have to reveal it. But I don't get off the hook on this. Because on the first side of my paper, under Wounded by the World, what it says is this. That when I was 12 years old, on the first day that I served Mass at my Catholic school at 6.15 in the morning, when Mass was over and I was putting the patents away in the sacristy, I was sexually molested by the pastor of my church. That's a game changer, guys. It messes up your life. Now, there's good news in that. One is it made me realize that that priest only needed to say, God, I'm sorry, and the same Jesus Christ that died for my sins died for his sins, and he's forgiven. That's great news. I have long ago forgiven the priest. I look forward to seeing him in heaven, and one day we'll celebrate the mercy of Jesus Christ together. But sadly, there's a second side to my piece of paper, and that's broken by sin. And what it says on my other side of this piece of purple paper is lust and unchaste behavior. My psychologists have told me over the years, trying to make me feel better, that Brian, maybe some of your struggles with sexual sin and lust and unchaste behavior were caused by what happened to you when you were 12 years old. But guys, I take full responsibility. Those were my sins. Those were my sins. And I didn't have the courage to tell anyone what I was struggling with, and therefore I kept struggling, and I would go to confession and say I was sorry, and do it again, and say I'm sorry, and do it again, because I was living in my own wall of shame. How could I tell my friends, my buddies, that I was struggling with sexual sin in my life? I was in a Curcio group with my closest best friends, and we met every week. And we talked about our relationship for God, and for 23 years, I never felt it was safe enough to admit that I was broken, and therefore I stayed broken. I wish that I would have known then what I know now. Do you know that there was a study done and that 85% of the sins confessed in the confessional by men have some sexual component to it? I wished I would have known that. I wouldn't have felt so isolated and ashamed. And guys, we're going to hear about, we've heard a little bit about before, the scourge of pornography on us. Guys, listen to these statistics. 80% of all men look at pornography once a month. 60% of all Christian men look at pornography once a month. 60% of all men look at pornography once a week, and 50% of all Christian clergy, Catholic and Protestant, look at pornography once a month. The U.S. Council of Catholic Bishops just wrote a paper on this, guys. Look it up. It's a serious problem. If you don't know about Reclaim, Reclaim is a program for... Uh, Catholics or otherwise that struggle with pornography. If it's a problem for you, seek it out. Now, I was told a long time ago that anytime Jesus wanted to get everyone's attention, he would say, amen, amen, I say to you. And I heard that if Jesus says, amen, I say, say to you, whatever he says next, you should write down, okay? So I'm going to draw from the master, and I'm going to use his technique, so I'm saying to you right now, amen, amen, I say to you. If you leave this conference fixated on my purple paper, and what's on your mind is Brian was sexually molested when he was a kid, or Brian had sexual sin in his life, if that's what you're focused on, my time here was a waste, and your time here was a waste, because what I want you fixated on is your purple paper. So I ask you again, does anyone on the planet know what's written on your purple paper. You know the really cool thing 
is that when you're quiet about this for a long time and you're embarrassed, but you finally, through the grace of God, bust through that and experience the mercy of God, you can't contain yourself. What was the secret for 42 years of my life is in the book, The Broken Door. I've been on Catholic radio talking about how cool it is to feel this forgiveness and to break free of those chains. God put it on my heart to send an inspirational message to 15 men in my parish four years ago. Four years later, Fourth Day Letters is being read on every continent in the world except Antarctica by Christians of all denominations. One of those he inspired, put on my heart, was called The Parable of the Broken Door. The Parable of the Broken Door led to the founding of Broken Door Ministries. Broken Door Ministries led to my dear friend Joe Galloway, who, by the way, as we speak, Joe is having the service for his wife this morning who just passed away at 55 years old of cancer. And my dear friend Joe wrote the book, The Broken Door, that contains elements of my life story. It's a Catholic fiction, and you all need to read it. It is a powerful, moving story. And all of those things happened, and I get the opportunity to go around the country and share the good news of God's mercy. And what I held as a secret is now something that I want to shout from the mountaintops. Why are we afraid? Humiliation, embarrassment, fear, and shame work to keep us in a wall. We can't let our fear keep us quiet. You all may have heard this quote, but it's a funny one. Matthew Kelly, I heard he's coming here soon, was giving a talk, and he was talking about the importance of going to reconciliation, and a man came up to him and he said, Matthew, I can't possibly confess my sin. Matthew says, why not? The guy says, it's too embarrassing. And Matthew says, get over yourself. Your sins aren't that original. <laughs> you know, for those of you that are near my age, you remember when George Carlin kind of broke all the news when he went on TV to say the seven words you couldn't say on TV. Well, I can't say those seven words here either, but I can tell you, I submit to you that you maybe have your seven sins that you can't say anywhere. You've got whatever's on your purple paper, and it has you so wounded and so broken that you're not willing to admit it. Guys, do you know all the time you hear the term good news? It's on bumper stickers and t-shirts, and we Christians just toss that term around like it's nothing. What is the good news? The good news isn't just that Jesus came into the world. The good news is that he knew before he came in the world that we were sinners. He came anyhow, and he paid the price for our sins, and we should be singing that to everyone. So can I get another giant amen to the reality that we're broken and we're scared? Amen? All right. We're blessed and we're broken and we're scared. Now, at the Last Supper, Jesus took the bread... And he did three things to that bread. What did he do? He blessed it, he broke it, and he shared it. He blessed it, broke it, and he shared it. Guys, we are not called to be blessed, broken, and scared. We're called to be blessed, broken, and shared. Blessed, broken, and shared is the Eucharist. Blessed, broken, and scared? Well, that's just scared. Being blessed, broken, and scared doesn't do us any good, and it doesn't do the world any good. Do you know that our Catholic theology tells us that we and you are called to be Eucharist yourself? We're called to be Eucharist to a starving world. But we can only be Eucharist if we're blessed, broken, and shared. Recently, in one of my fourth day letters, I wrote an article called Moon Glow. And all of us know that since the beginning of mankind, we have romanticized the moon. But what is the moon? The moon is nothing more than space junk. It's dirt. It doesn't glow. It reflects the light of the sun. Are we called to reflect the light of Christ? No. 
We're called to radiate the light of Christ because unlike the space junk, the moon, although we may be space junk ourselves, we, Father pointed out earlier, that we consume the Eucharist and Christ dwells in us and we are called to let the Christ in us touch those that we touch. They need to meet Jesus through us. We are called to be the Eucharist for a starving world. You know, shared, the second letter in shared, we circled C and scared, the second letter in shared is H. H, honesty. Are we willing to be honest and admit that we're broken? Because when we do, we will be Eucharist for a starving world. Now guys, there are two heroes to my story today. I'm not one of them. There's two heroes. Remember I said God put it on my heart to admit I was broken. Although I spoke, I got the courage to speak about having been molested right after I left, I never got the courage to admit what I was really broken with, that I was struggling with some sexual sin in my life. And we actually made a drive, two of my friends, both Bobs, one is here today helping me with the sale of books. We are gonna to refer to him as Bob the Lesser. The other one in the car was Bob the Greater, and you'll see why. We, were in, we made a trip over here to bring someone to a Curseal meeting, and so the two Bobs and I were driving back to Hendersonville. We had about two hours of time, and we were on this conversation of brokenness in our life. And I asked him the question, guys, do you ever have the point which you have something you wanna share, and it maybe makes it as far as your Adam's apple, or maybe all the way to your lips, but you can't admit it, you can't say it. They go, yep, yep, we have that problem. But not one of us was willing to say what it was. So about three days after that car trip, Bob the Greater sends me an email. And in that email, he says, Brian, it seemed obvious to me in that car ride that there was something that was on your heart that you wanted to share. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, I'm here for you and I won't change my opinion of you. You know what I did to that email? I deleted it. About one week later, I got another email from Bob. It says, Brian, I don't know if you saw my email I sent you a week ago. <laughs> but in that, I said, if there's something bugging you, I'm here for you. And you know what I did? I deleted that. And a couple days later, I got the third email. And when it popped up, immediately my mind went to Peter's denial for the third time. And I thought, this man is trying to be Christ to me. I've denied him twice, and I am not going to do it a third time. And I wrote back and said, where and when? And we just happened to pick a frozen yogurt store in Hendersonville. And for the first time in 42 years, I told another human being what I was struggling with. Now, I had confessed it a million times but I'm talking about telling a friend what I struggled with. You know what he did? Gave me a hug and said, Brian, I love you more now than I did before because of the courage it took to share that. Bob is a hero in this story. But there's another hero, guys. There's another hero to this story. It takes great causes me great pain to have to go in front of audiences and talk and admit that I had sexual sin in my life. So the other hero of this story is my wife. We're celebrating 40 years this year. And yet in a book and on the radio and in interviews and in groups like this, I stand and admit I had sexual sin in my life. Listen, listen to the words my wife shared with me. She said, Brian, if part of you is broken, then I love that part too because I love all of you. Brian, if part of you is broken, then I love that part too because I love all of you. And guys, I am going to say to you that as we sit here right now, God himself is looking down on every one of you, calling you by your name and saying, if part of you is broken, then I love that part too, because I love all of you. 
Guys, we are called to be wounded healers. We're not called to go out and glamorize our brokenness. We're called, called to go out and admit that we're broken so we can talk about God's forgiveness. There's joy in being saved. Some of you, when you admit your brokenness, will be able to go out and shout it from the mountaintops. Others will share it in a more quiet-like way. But like the blind man who received his sight by Jesus, and Jesus said, don't tell anyone, he couldn't help himself. They says he told the whole town. When you admit your brokenness and the mercy of Jesus, you can't contain yourself from sharing it. So when you leave here today, do you want to leave here blessed, broken, and scared? Or for the sake of Jesus Christ, are you willing to shed your pride, become vulnerable, and share your brokenness so that you can heal and perhaps those you share it with can heal as well. Listen to this quote from Pope Francis. The more conscious we are of our wretchedness in our sins, the more we experience the love and infinite mercy of God among us. <clears throat> then the more capable we are of looking upon the many wounded we meet along the way with acceptance and mercy. Guys, Christianity is not a solo sport. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, he who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. I want to strongly encourage you to get yourself in some type of a weekly group setting. It doesn't have to be a Curcio group. It doesn't have to be a structured group. Is there anyone here that doesn't like to have friends? Guys, I just want you to build strong Christian friendships. Find yourself four or five or six guys and commit that you're going to get together every week for the rest of your life. You're going to talk about three things. How are we doing in our communication with God? Is God are God and I talking this week or is there a problem? And the second thing, ask yourself these two questions. Under study, under the concept of study, what did God reveal to me this week about me that I never knew before? Because St. Augustine says in order to know God, we've got to know ourselves. And what did God reveal to me about him this week? And then finally, we got to talk to each other about are we sharing the good news? Now, guys, these little groups are nothing structured. They're just friendships. You can do it at a bar. You can do it at a coffee shop. You can do it at the church office. Just find yourself a group of friends. If, you, if you're not in a group, get in a group. Start a group. But we are called to be communal. And when you have those kind of close friends, eventually those friendships will allow you to take your mask off and to be honest. Now, the next part of this is really important. Particularly, it was different for us today than the ladies I spoke to last night. We're fix-it people. So when our friends say they're broken, what do we want to do? We want to fix them. Well, when I told my friend, he was like, he wanted to fix me. And I said, you can't do it. God's struggling to do it. You're not going to do it. So, guys, was Mary able to stop her son's crucifixion? Was John, when all the other disciples left, and John was there witnessing the crucifixion, could he stop it? No. Simon helped carry the cross. He lightened the load. This is what it says in Romans. We got to weep with those who weep. Weep with those who weep. We're called to share our brokenness so that we can share the excitement of God to lighten the load that's on our shoulders. If we just remember these three simple words, let's look inward, let's look upward, and then let's look outward in to see the brokenness, up to experience the mercy, and out to share the mercy with others. Look around the room one more time, please. Look around the room. Guys, everyone here has that piece of purple paper in their pocket. You know what that means? You're sitting in a sea of purple. And everyone's admitted that no one knows what's on their paper. They're wearing masks, too. Can you help them take their mask off? In a tragic story, there was a mother who was interviewed 
in the newspaper in Cincinnati, Ohio, about her 18 years old, 18 year old son's recent suicide. And let these words sink in, guys. This is what the mother said in that interview. It's hard to heal the wounds you cannot see. It's hard to heal the wounds you cannot see. That mother didn't know the deep woundedness of her son, and she couldn't stop the inevitable, and it finished in suicide. It's hard to heal. Look around again. Guys, we're all broken, and we're afraid to admit it. So can you be the one that helps someone else with their brokenness? Our mission statement at Broken Door Ministries, it's cute, it's small, but listen to the wisdom in it. I'm broken. You're broken. He's not. Let's talk. I'm broken, you're broken, he's not, let's talk. What do I want the takeaways to be today? When you leave here, here are the takeaways. We're all broken, we all wear masks. It's important because of Christian community that we, we build deep, sincere, lasting friendships with our friends and we talk about Jesus and we meet weekly. We help each other reveal what's on our purple paper and in the process, one day will come when we can reveal our own and that will allow us to be Eucharist to a starving world. Now, there's only two stories that are in all four Gospels. One's the crucifixion. Does anyone know what the other one is? It's the story of the loaves and the fishes. It's the only two that are in all four Gospels. And in the story of the loaves and fishes, there's something unique about John's Gospel that's not in the other ones. And in John's Gospel, it's the little boy that has the loaves and fishes. Now imagine if you were the parent of that little boy and you heard about this great rabbi and you knew that he was long-winded and he was going to tell great stories and he had these really cool parables. So you guys get your blanket, you get your picnic basket and you put some loaves and fishes in there because you anticipate being there all day and you get out there early and you get a front row seat to the preacher. And about part way through the day, you all aren't even paying attention, but your little son is focused and he hears Jesus say to his buddies, how are we going to feed these people? And before you can react, your son grabs your picnic basket and goes running up and says, Master, can you use these loaves and fishes? If you're a dad like I am, you would have said, Son, get back here. That's our food. Let those other people fend for themselves. But the little boy reacted. Did Jesus need the loaves and the fishes in order to feed those people? He could have snapped his fingers and that entire group could have had an Outback Steakhouse tonight. It could have just dropped down there with the forks, knives, napkins, and dessert. But that's not the way God works. Now, there's only been one time in my adult life that I've ever heard a priest use the word haunted in a sermon. And when I heard this priest give this sermon, he said, and I say to you, I want you haunted for the rest of your life by the actions of the little boy. Because you see, the little boy wouldn't have lost out that day. He had food. But because he responded to the Lord's call, 5,000 plus people ate that day, and we know about it 2,000 years later. So the reason the word haunted is there is because, guys, you're being called. And if you don't respond to the call, it's not you that may lose out on the miracle. But if you're willing to open up about your brokenness, or you're willing to reach out and to say to someone else, is there something that's on your heart like my friend did to me when my friend Bob touched me, he was the little boy, and I've received a miracle in my life as a result of his actions. I wouldn't be speaking to you today, but for the result of my friend being Christ to me. Are you willing to take up that call and to act and to be Eucharist to others? I'm gonna close with just a couple more quick things, and the first is a quote from Pope Francis. A hurting person is in a storm, 
They are cold, wet, shivering, and scared. Preaching platitudes and advice will not get them out of the storm. Do not tell a person in a storm that it's a sunny day. There will likely come a day when the clouds part, but it's not today. Now listen, guys, listen. It's not your job to pull them out of the storm. It's your job to get wet with them. We all know that we've been blessed. We all acknowledge that we're broken. Let's stop being scared. Let's start being shared. Let's respond like the little boy. And let's be Eucharist to a starving world. Amen. Amen. Thank you.